Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to this Resistance 101 event. As you can tell, we're all in a different room than we were originally supposed to be in. Um, and the reason why is because there was a PhD student who uh, made a complaint towards the committee investigation and the NYPD that this event was an event that sponsored or was a terrorist event, quote unquote. Um, so the Barnard Center for Research on Women had to cancel on us last minute because they were concerned. Um, so yeah, essentially this is part of Colombia's long line of repression that we're kind of used to at this point, but it's kind of ironic following the fact that there was a raging Islamophobe who was literally here a few days ago. Um, but yeah, just had to explain that clarification to everyone because, you know, I, I don't know if everyone had the explanation as to why we had changed rooms. Um, but jumping into our event today, it's going to be a one hour panel discussion with our panel, our speakers. Um, and then it's going to be followed by a 30 minute um, Q&A. Is the QR code up? Mm. No. Okay, so we'll put the QR code um, up in a minute. But basically, if you guys want to scan the QR code, you guys can submit questions throughout and then we'll be um, basically announcing the questions at the end um, during our 30 minute Q&A session. Um, before we start with introducing our panel speakers, Kayla's just going to go over some safety tips um, for this event. All right, um, we'll just go through some uh, safety guidelines. So here we have, so in this room we have our safety marshals. You guys should raise your hands. Good. So um, so if you need and basically anything during this event, um, please approach one of the uh, safety marshals. Um, there's some on this side, some on that side as well. Um, any recording or photographing during this event is prohibited. Um, and if you, we do find you doing that, you'll be escorted out by the marshals. But that would be fine. Um, yeah. And so now I'd like to, uh, or Sarah will introduce mm -hmm. the panel. Um, so our panelists today, we have three of our panelists here to on Zoom. Um, our first panel speaker is Nadine Kiswani. Nadine Kiswani is, yeah, <laughs> is the chair of Within Our Lifetime and co-founder of CUNY for Palestine. Uh, our second panelist is Charlotte Cates, who is on Zoom. Um, Charlotte <laughs> is the International Coordinator of the Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoners Network. Um, our third panelist is Khaled Barakat, who is a Palestinian writer, <laughs> writer and member of the Executive Committee, Committee of Mosul Baden, um, the Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Task Movement. Um, and then our fourth panelist is Michael, who's a local organizer with Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoners Network in New York, New Jersey. And then our last panelist is Sean Aaron, um, Aaron. Aaron. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> a member of the National Students for Justice in Palestine Steering Committee and lead editor of the Written Resistance. Everyone welcome. All right, so very quickly on the uh, screen is the QR code. You can scan that and take you to a website where you can ask your questions. So if you have questions for the later part of the segment, please scan it now. Good. All right, so uh, we'll, so first, again, we'll start with um, questions that were prepared for the panel. Um, and so first question is, uh, just to provide some context for our audience members, uh, can you guys tell us what Palestinians are resisting against and what Palestinians are fighting for? Um, I guess I can start us off. Um, for almost a century at this point, Palestinians have been resisting um, violence, settler, colonialism, Zionism, which is the plan um, to colonize Palestine, um, to, you know, encourage migration from Europe, um, to literally take over Palestinian land um, by literally by any means necessary, which was killing the indigenous population, uh, expelling the indigenous population, um, this, you know, we know that Zionism um, was introduced by Theodore Herzl, and it was introduced decades before 1948, um, which marks the Nakba, which marks when 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly expelled from their homelands, at least 531 villages depopulated. But, you know, um, leading up to this, it, it took time, you know, to actually make this happen. Um, Palestinians res resisted settler colonialism when we lived under British settler colonialism. We resisted it under um, the Ottoman Empire. We will resist um, Zionist settler colonialism in any iterations 
of it to come. Um, we believe that Palestine has the right to be free, and that doesn't just mean a, a two-state solution. It means every single inch of Palestine from the river to the sea. When we talk about Palestinian refugees, we understand that a majority of Palestinians actually at this point, or I don't know if the majority, but more Palestinians live outside of Palestine than in Palestine at this point. Um, sorry, I can hear my echo, so it's like <laughs> disorienting. Um, where was I at? Like more oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, when we talk about Palestinian freedom and we exclude the Palestinian right to return, you know, to their original homes and towns and villages, then you're not talking about Palestinian freedom. You know, it's not just Gaza and the West Bank, um, although we are so honored and we are so um, lucky to have, you know, our people in Gaza and our people in the West Bank continuing to fight for us for a free Palestine, to put everything on the line. Because without them, without, you know, uh, our resistance fighting, I may not be alive today. Palestine may not be alive today. There might not be something called Palestine. So this is this is what we're fighting for, I guess, in the simplest terms. We were kicked off of our land forcibly. Um, our people continue to be exploited. They continue to be killed. In Gaza, they are used as lab rats, where Israel can test weapons technology, weapon technologies on us, like the drones that you saw blow up those four Palestinians to bits in Gaza the other day. Um, and they will export this technology, you know, around the world. So when we fight for Palestine, we're not just fighting for Palestinian freedom and liberation from oppression. We're fighting for the freedom of all oppressed people, because whatever tactics of oppression that are, are developed and accepted and um, spread out, you know, from, by Zionists, through Palestine, they're going to export that to the rest of the world. And we see that through the um, police training with one another. We see that through the drone surveillance technology overhead at our protests right now that comes from Zionists and Occupy Palestine or so-called Israel. Um, and at the end of the day, we understand that whatever they're allowed to get away with in Palestine, they're going to they're gonna bring it on to the rest of the world. Um, you know, ultimately... The Palestinian liberation struggle, um, you know, all the resistance factions that are, that are fighting for that. It's ultimately a nationalist struggle, a national liberation struggle, uh, where we believe that all of our people um, have the right to live in freedom and dignity from the river to the sea, every inch of Palestine, in their original homes, Haifa, Yaffa, Akka, not just the, not just the West Bank, not just Gaza. Um, although they are on the, they are the vanguard and they are leading our struggle um, as, as people who ultimately face the, the harshest um, consequences of Zionist settler colonialism. You know, up until last, up until this summer, I was banned from even visiting Palestine. All four of my grandparents were born there. All four of them. My father was born there and I was banned. The only reason I was able to go this summer is because um, the so-called state of Israel wanted access to the visa waiver program, right? Um, and the only reason that I could even go before I was banned was because I'm an American citizen. But my my mom's family who live in Jordan, where most of the Palestinian refugees live, um, are not even able to visit. They've never been able to visit, even though they live just one hour away. And they don't even get fully recognized um, they don't have citizenship in Jordan, along with what many Palestinians are experiencing in Lebanon, other neighboring Arab countries um, all over the world. Um, and, you know, they are still fighting. They're originally from Yaffa. They're still fighting for to return to their original homes and towns. They've never ex accepted uh, this idea that they would be kicked out and then they have this new identity, this new nationality. When I was banned, I was interrogated by the Israeli soldier who asked me, why do I even identify as a Palestinian? If I was born in Jordan and I live in America, then I'm American now. I'm, I'm Jordanian now. This is what they want us to accept, and we won't accept that. We assert our nationhood. We assert that we are still one people, even if they try to spread us apart, even if they want to make um, you know, the so-called two-state solution non-contiguous, having Gaza completely isolated from the West Bank, having us scattered throughout refugee camps and across the world. They want us to be liquidated. Um, into whatever places that, that we ended up in. And we refuse this. We assert that we are one people, one nation. We have the right to return home. And we will get that right by any means necessary.
Um, do any of the other panelists want to answer this question here on Zoom? I uh, would just say a few words. Uh, um, I mean, I agree with everything Nardine said, and she said it so eloquently. Um, but I just want to thank you for inviting us and to be part of this uh, panel. And at the same time, I know that uh, students in, in the U.S. have been like harassed by the Zionists. And as we speak right now, tens of thousands of Palestinians and Jordanians are marching towards the Zionist embassy in Jordan. And they've been uh, blocked by the Jordanian army and police. But, uh, you know, uh, our people are also besieging their uh, Zionist institutions and embassies. So it's... Uh, the, the struggle continues. They, they cannot just harass, harass us. I wanted to say that to understand the Palestinian uh, struggle uh, and resistance, it's very important to put it in context as a, an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial struggle. It's not just a conflict between Palestinians and Israeli settlers or uh, Zionists. It's uh, more than that. The very first attempt to colonize Palestine uh, was at the hands of the uh, French in 1800s when Napoleon paid a visit to Palestine with his army and he was defeated. And he wrote that it was the defeat that ended uh, very much uh, his, uh, you know, uh, le legendary life. Uh, Palestinians have been fighting colonialism for over uh, 200 years and uh, every time uh, there is a stage in their struggle that's why before 1948 you won't hear the word the right of return for example simply because palestinians were not displaced and they were not refugees they were fighting as a nation on their homeland but the right of return today is a central uh, issue for palestinians and it is the core uh, issue for palestinian refugees and uh, often when we speak about palestine and especially during these times when the conflict is uh, very visible whether in gaza or the west bank or in jerusalem we uh, focus, all of us, on what's happening in Palestine. But over 60% of our people live outside Palestine. And so the struggle of Palestinians in the diaspora and in exile, as Nardine mentioned, uh, it's central to our uh, people. And uh, it's really important to see how the Al-Aqsa flood operation have liberated the Palestinian um, inner strength outside the new generations uh, that today are getting involved in the struggle uh, and it's so visible in the US, Canada, Europe and elsewhere of uh, a new generation that is actually leading our struggle in the diaspora. So I just wanted to say these few points uh, in order maybe to complete kind of the, the picture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Pilot, for providing that context on to why Palestinians are resisting and what they're resisting against. Um, if any of the panelists can answer what are the different forms of resistance Palestinians have employed, um, specifically, what is guerrilla warfare and why is it the chosen tactic in asymmetric warfare? If it wants to go. And could someone also explain what asymmetric warfare is as well? Yes. Someone want to go? I can talk about the different forms of Palestinian resistance, yeah. but not um, the guerrilla warfare. If someone wants to take can, over that part. Okay, I'll take that part. It'll be good. Now we're trying to start with it. <laughs> okay, so we can start. We can start with Nadine explaining the different forms of Palestinian resistance, and then uh, we'll do Michael, then Charlotte. Okay. As I said before, Palestinians have resisted settler colonialism and genocide for a century, using all sorts of strategies, tactics, 
and approaches, strikes, marches, demonstrations. But, you know, of course, armed struggle is what immediately comes to mind when you think about um, the resistance. And something. this is something that we know that Palestinians have a right to engage in under international law as an occupied and colonized people. And regardless whether this was enshrined in international law or not, we have uh, we have the right mm -hmm. to do so, um, not granted to us by, you know, bodies like the United Nations, which was the first thing they did was partition Palestine. But even, you know, um, through their imperialist colonial lens, we still, you know, technically have this right. Um, and this was employed since before the inception of the state of so-called Israel during the Nakba against the, against the British Mandate occupation. After the Nakba, um, you know, with the foundation of the PLO and various groups fighting for the liberation of Palestine, the target of armed struggle was liberation from the Zionist entity and occupation. Historically, armed struggle has been a part of a constellation of resistance efforts which have served as critical to establishing the Palestinian people as a political force. Armed struggle helps shape the PLO into a quasi-state actor within refugee camps in the Arab world who use the tactic to assert political will in a manner that opens the door for popular education, cultural development, the formation of a collective, a collective history of the indigenous Palestinians' relationship with their land and their forced displacement in the Nakba. It also allowed for the PLO to effectively serve as a representative of the, of the Palestinian people. Of course, this is no longer um, applicable. We're talking about, you know, at the time. Um, and, you know, the international bodies such as the UN still consider the PLO as a sole leg legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Although clearly, you know, we refute this given that, um, you know, Hamas was democratically elected in Gaza and there was a coup backed by the U.S., backed by Israel um, to get them out of power and to get the PA into power, um, who are now the unelected leadership, you know, of Palestine. Um, you know, what even got the PLO to this point was the armed resistance uh, that we saw in the first and, and the first Intifada which, you know, started, like I said, with demonstrations, with pit, with pickets, with boycotts, with strikes. And of course, armed struggle was a part of that. And that kind of um, gave, gave way for us to get a seat at the table um, when it comes to these, you know, negotiations. But, you know, um, in 1993, the PLO surrendered the cause of armed struggle for the Oslo so-called peace agreement effectively selling out Palestine, effectively sidelining every single um, faction that that did not, you know, agree with this to be considered terrorist organizations. This is why, um, you know, so many groups like the PFLP and others are considered terrorist organizations. It's because they rejected um, being puppeted by Israel and the U.S. They rejected this. And then the only group that didn't reject this, they're the group in power. And of course, the Palestinian people um, resisted this with the second Intifada, um, you know, showing that, you know, signing Oslo and, so, and Oslo was signed the year before I was born. So I don't consent to my rights, my right of return being given away, just like many other Palestinians um, didn't at the time and still don't today. Uh, they continued armed struggle. And, and up until now, we're seeing armed struggle in Gaza to this day. But, you know, even the, the so-called legitimate forces or the legitimate uh, representatives of Palestine, how do they get there? It was it was initially through armed struggle. So this has always been, you know, a, a part of um, our, you know, how we're able to continue to be here until until today. Um, but of course, the only groups that, you know, are going to be called terrorists are the ones who are rejecting, um, you know, Israeli settler colonialism, um, over our land. So today, this is what the resistance is aiming to do in the long term. Um, as factions have met in Lebanon and announced their intention of forming a new unity government in opposition to the PA or the Palestinian Authority for those, uh, sorry, just going all in with the acronyms, let me know uh, if anything doesn't make sense, um, who now is a neo-colonial arm of the Zionist occupation. And, you know, when just a side point, as I remember this, when Hillary Clinton's emails leaked, um, she actually said, why didn't we rig the elections? Because they were upset that um, Hamas won. They were the democratically elected leadership of Palestine. Um, and, you know, in order 
for Israel to continue its narrative and the U.S. to continue its narrative that they want a two-state solution, uh, the only way that, that they can continue that is by um, having, you know, establishing a coup, you know, getting um, the, the Palestinian Authority in power, getting Abu Mazen um, or Mahmoud Abbas in power. And I believe if you talk to a majority of Palestinians today, um, they reject him, they reject his leadership. There's a reason that Hamas won, and there's a reason that to this day, yes, they're considered a terrorist organization by the U.S. and by Israel, but there are many countries and many people around the world. I think even the U.N. still does not consider them um, a terrorist organization. On the topic of what guerrilla and asymmetric warfare are, uh, it needs to be understood in the fact that you're fighting a, an enemy that's stronger than you, and you have one important uh, weapon on your side, which is the people. An important part of guerrilla warfare is moving through the people like fish to the sea and attacking the enemy where they're weakest and where they don't know. So an important part about guerrilla attacks is attacking the rear and finding the weakest, most isolated part of the enemy and then attacking them there. If we see like a, without lots of blood, um, the guerrillas attacked the weakest parts of the you know, concentration camp gates they had around Gaza, and they were able to flood through there and spread all throughout different parts of you know, southern 48. And that's just an important part of the essence of what guerrilla warfare is, because it's not attacking the enemy head on, but it's attacking them where they're weakest. Uh, asymmetric warfare, and especially liberation struggles, is important, because if you look at it, the IOF has you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, hundreds of tanks, hundreds of drones, hundreds of planes, but they don't have the capacity to be able to police. And Sorry, people. Michael, can you speak up? Because people on in Zoom, yeah, people on Zoom can't hear you. All right. Sorry. So the essence of guerrilla warfare is fighting the enemy where they're the weakest and where you're the strongest, and also fighting them at the rear, at, and then you know being quick and going at locations where they can't find you. So if you look at it, especially in the West Bank, you see a lot of urban guerrilla attacks when the IOF is at locations where they're weak. When you see operations happening, you'll see uh, members of the brigades will go. So like when soldiers are at gas stations, when they're like their guard is down, they'll go and watch the attack and then they'll retreat back into the countryside or the city. That's an important part when you're fighting a liberation struggle where you don't have an army that's the size of the IOF. So the IOF may have tanks, but what you have is one, you have people determined to fight, and two, you have the masses of people on your side. So when you have those two aspects, it's able to negate the capacity of the enemy because you can fight them through sheer numbers and also confusion. Uh, asymmetric warfare, especially in the case of the Middle East, has proved to be very successful. You see in the Algerian War of Independence, the Algerians were able to mobilize the people in order to engage in guerrilla actions. More recently, you see in Iraq, uh, a big part that of American uh, failure is the failure to combat IEDs, which were not you know, weapons made in factories that are supposedly precision and humane, but they were made out of pressure cookers, dumpsters, garbage, basically, filled with munitions that were able to blow up tanks that were able to you know, cause serious losses. So that's the reason why the Palestinians adopt these tactics. If you look at it especially as well, in 1982, the PLO in Lebanon had a large kind of conventional organization, but what they failed was being able to fight the IOF head on. But now what we see the Palestinians succeed in is fighting the IOF asymmetrically. Instead of using jets or tanks, they use, you know, paragliders, they use drones, they use all types of weapons that the enemy isn't designed to protect against. And if you see the military victories against Israel, that have been the largest, which Al-Aqsa flood was, was an asymmetric fight. Uh, during the Arab-Israeli wars, a lot of the Arab states were fighting IOF head on and they were failing. They had, even though they had tanks and they had jets, but you know, the Palestinians have small arms, they have IEDs, they have paragliders really, and that's it. They have rockets that they make from having to dive through the wreckage in Gaza, and they're able to, you know, inflict heavy losses. All right, so are there any more questions? Sure. Sure. So I will um, contribute in addition to the great points that Nardine and Michael have already made. Um, one of the points that I, I, Nardine mentioned, and I think it's important to emphasize, is that the comprehensive resistance of the Palestinian people has never been an alternative to or an escape from armed struggle, but rather part and parcel of one comprehensive struggle. So like one of the things that sometimes happens in the movement, particularly in North America, is that we are told that, for example, boycotting Israel is an alternative to the Palestinian armed struggle or a more humane way of carrying out the struggle, when in fact, these two are two 
two complementary approaches that are with armed struggle is the primary form of struggle that are working to achieve the liberation of the Palestinian people. And so these forms of resistance don't come in contradiction with each other, but as part of building a popular mass base of the resistance that is capable of involving all sectors of the population um, from children to elders to internationals in solidarity around the world in a comprehensive resistance project that's rejecting the Zionist entity in all of its forms. And this, this, I mean, we've heard already about the great history of resistance of the Palestinian people, but that resistance history is leading to the struggle that we see today. I mean, right now, Gaza is the heart of the Palestinian resistance. Um, and it's the beating heart of the Palestinian resistance. And, and Nardine gave a great history of what's happened since 2006 to make that possible um, and the way in which the Palestinian people rejected the coup attempt and were able to build the tunnels to go, to build the tunnels to go underground to develop comprehensive systems of building weapons, not only to use weaponry that was, you know, received from other parts of the axis of resistance, but also to create Palestinian-made weaponry inside Gaza that the Palestinian resistance is currently using to defend the land and the people against genocide. And that's a tremendous achievement, especially given the level of, um, the, the level of struggle and the situation that Palestinians in Gaza are faced with, given the fact that this is a small area of land. Uh, it's very difficult to find like low visibility areas such as mountains and jungles, which are often more successful bases for guerrilla warfare, and that the Palestinian resistance has been able to essentially create through the tunnels um, a base area from which it's able to lead operations and able to conduct uh, very powerful resistance operations. I mean, if we look at October 7th, we always make the point, and it's an absolutely correct point, that this battle did not start on October 7th, and the genocide did not start on October 7th. And we're talking about 76 years and, in fact, over 100 years of struggle. But the fact is that October 7th changed the world. And that changing of the world is something that was built on the history of the resistance, for example, in Gaza from you know 1967 to 72, when at that time it was the Palestinian left that was leading the resistance. Uh, the, 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 one of the leaders, one of the commanders, Mohammed al-Aswad, was known as uh, Guvar. Gaza, che Guevara of Gaza. Um, and it was Moshe Dayan who said that we control the strip during the day and he controls it at night. Um, there was a center of the Palestinian resistance in Jordan. There's a center of the Palestinian resistance in Lebanon. And today that center is in Gaza. And it's go and, and despite the genocide, the attacks, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity. What we've also seen is that the resistance has only grown stronger, more resilient, and with an even greater level of popular Arab and international depth, um, and that this is actually on a path towards victory, which is why the resistance has been able to strike such significant blows against the occupier, despite the fact that every imperialist state in the world has seen the advancement of Zionist genocide as central to the program of saving imperialism in the region. Thank you guys for your uh, answers to those questions. And so our next question will be, um, what are the different armed resistance groups in Palestine? And so we know that they've come together with a shared objective or multiple objectives. Um, so could you guys also repeat on the specific objectives of the resistance? Uh, who would like to answer? All right, so there are multiple groups both in Palestine and outside. Oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry about that. So there are multiple groups both inside and outside Palestine. The five major groups would probably be Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the PFLP, the BFLP, and Fatah. So Fatah is it's a different wing of Fatah. It's not Abu Mazen's faction. It's the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. Uh, these groups are all united under the Joint Operations Room with other groups, uh, both in Gaza and the West Bank and also 48, with the express purpose of fighting the occupation. Hamas is the largest group, the democratically elected government of Palestine. They have mass support in Gaza. They have around uh, tens of thousands of fighters in the Al-Qassam brigades. An important thing, too, is they make their own weapons. The Yassin rockets that they've been using to blow up Zionist tanks were made in Gaza, 100% indigenous made. Even their sniper rifles, too, that they use have been made in Gaza. There are rockets as well that they've developed to large capacities. So it's a really inspiring thing to see this group that's been under siege by Egypt, 
Israel, the United States, basically everyone, Arab reaction, Western imperialism, Zionism, they've been able to create these weapons that have been able to destroy, you know, the most fascist military, one of the most fascist militaries in the world. Uh, you have the PIJ as well. They have a very large capacity who, and they've been fighting, especially in 2022, they've been fighting the occupation head on. You know, West Bank currently actually in Kotkerum last night, they were fighting the occupation. They carried out a pretty devastating operation. Uh, the PFLP and DFLP, I know especially, amongst the Western left, they get a lot of attention and they've been doing a lot of fighting and they've been engaged in the Al-Aqsa flood operation. And as well as the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, especially in the West Bank, have been carrying the flag of Palestinian resistance. They came out of Fatah, but they came out of, the de they rejected the generation of it under Abu Mazen and the late Yasser Arafat. And especially, you know, heroic martyrs like Ibrahim al Mabusi were part of it. And they've, you know, gained a space in the Palestinian struggle. And you can even see in their recent statement against the capitulation of Abu Mazen and his faction, they stated their allegiance to Hamas, they stated their allegiance to the Joint Operations Room and the Palestinian resistance. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Michael, for the great overview, got really detailed. Um, I have a few things to add that, uh, you know, are, are just of personal interest to me uh, in the way that these factions have sort of oriented themselves over the past few decades and the progress that they've made in furthering the struggle and the direction that they've taken. Um, I also wanted to mention the Popular Resistance Committees, which is uh, smaller, but also very important yeah. uh, part of the movement. Too. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's several more smaller groups that are sort of, they work with the, the Joint Operations Room, and so they sort of fall under their same operations, and they don't get as much of a, a attention, but uh, they're just as important in determining strategy and uh, sort of the way that these groups act. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, this shift in militaristic strategy that came since the early 2000s with the introduction of the Joint Operations Room. Um, and the, the sort of ingenuity that's displayed by the national groups um, that was not to, you know, not give credit where credit is due, but that was somewhat absent in previous decades. Uh, we have uh, Hamas um, pursuing national liberation in a very peculiar way, which is essentially creating what everyone, I think, considers a united front, but they don't explicitly call it that, um, using a, a kind of a blend of, of tactics and a blend of ideologies um, that some people relate to Maoism, some people relate to Orthodox Marxist-Leninism um, from a party that is not, uh, you know, overtly leftist. It's a, it's a purely Islamic nationalist party. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting dynamic to observe because you have these, you know, these leftist groups that are heralded by uh, especially Western leftists, the DFLP and the PFLP, um, partner, entering into partnerships and also sharing tactics um, with the nationalist groups. Um, and I think you can see this in the development of cellular warfare um, that has showed up uh, and been implemented to great success throughout Alexa Flood. It's sort of a version of guerrilla warfare. It's also a combination of guerrilla warfare with protracted people's war, which is a Maoist technique. And I think I would infer that the DFLP had a significant influence on that tactic choice where there are individual cells uh, of al Qasim brigades that are essentially operating autonomously but there's enough coordination and enough centralized goals that they can act without being directed. So this allows them to evade um, or uh, avoid really uh, impacts on strategy due to internet outages. Um, this prevents them from relying on satellite phones or other methods of communication that are visible to the enemy and uh, traceable, um, able to be intercepted, all of these things. And so you have this development of a, a resistance body that is essentially impenetrable, impenetrable to uh, the modern technological advances that make modern warfare so successful. And so you have a situation where the most well-equipped, one of the most well-equipped militaries in the world, fully funded by the United States, and you know, given the, the most advanced weaponry we have, is unable to make a dent in these communication networks because they simply are working as if we're 40 years in the past. Um, and it's, it's really incredible to see um, it's, it's inspirational. It's also uh, a development that is showing a new era in the Palestinian struggle. We have unprecedented unity among what used to be kind of called a fringe group of the rejectionist front. Yeah. Um, this is now the core of the united strength of the Palestinian resistance and the Palestinian people. Um, people talk about the popular cradle. You know, to have six, seven factions utilizing the same popular cradle and utilizing the same consent of the Palestinian people and the surrounding civilians to carry out an operation like this is, is completely unprecedented. And I think 
throughout all of the horror that we're witnessing, it's really important to ground ourselves in that as well. This is definitely a new era uh, in the Palestinian resistance. And an important thing to note too, outside of Palestine, I know we've been talking about Yemen and Lebanon especially, there's Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon. It was founded as like a popular resistance movement in response to the Israeli occupation of Lebanon in uh, following the 1982 war. And it's proved time and time again the myth of Israeli invincibility. They were able to defeat the Israelis out of South Lebanon, which culminated in 2000. They were able to defeat Israel in 2006. And now they're holding up Israel. They have I mean, hundreds of thousands of settlers. I believe it's around 300,000 that evacuated the north because of Hezbollah rocket fire. And it goes to show, you know, how the people want resistance. People don't want this peace process. They don't want these like Oslo farces. They want to fight and they want to fight for the Palestinian people. And going into Yemen too, with Ansar Allah, it's exactly the same. Ansar Allah was founded in the early 2000s. And people call it the Houthi movement, but that was actually pejorative by the pro-U.S. seller government. They called it the Houthi movement because they wanted to say it's kind of a cult around the leadership. But in reality, it was a, it's a popular resistance movement which is founded outside, which is founded out of both marginalization, poverty, with the collapse of South Yemen, and discrimination against Shias, and also a culmination in anti anti U.S. sentiment because of the Iraq War. They saw what was happening to their Arab brothers in Iraq, so they said, "We don't want this to happen to Yemen. We want you know our leader out." And the fact of the matter is, they've been they fought a multi decade long insurgency, culminating with their capture of Sanaa. Uh, they have the Saudis on their on the backslide. They have the U.S. not able to defeat them, and they've been able to go up against world capital itself with you know blockading Baba Nadab, which is one of the busiest part of one of the busiest trade routes in the world. And they've been able to hold and they've been able to have people supporting them that whole time. It's just quite inspiring for us when we think about trying to build movements here, you know, fighting imperialism, fighting inequality. Yeah, um, Michael just touched upon this a little bit, um, where there's other armed resistance groups in the region who are often engaged in the Palestinian liberation struggle um, as part of the struggle to end U.S. imperialism, which is often referred to as the axis of resistance, which Charlotte alluded to. Um, if you can just expand on this, Charlotte, I know Michael just touched upon it, but can we go through what these resistance groups are and which countries they're from, what they're involved in and what their motives are? Sure. Um, and, and thank you to Michael for introducing this part of the discussion, because it is a very necessary and natural um, connection that we're talking about here. Like when we talk about the ways in which Palestinian resistance groups are organizing themselves and using particular tactics of struggle, um, the lessons that have been learned from the Lebanese resistance led by Hezbollah have really been central to that kind of development in the past several decades of Palestinian resistance, particularly since the victory and the liberation of the south of Lebanon in, to, in uh, May 2000. And so it has been um, that collaboration with the Lebanese resistance that has been in many ways, very central to the development of the strategies and tactics of the Palestinian resistance, as well as building on that historical experience of Palestinian resistance. So when we speak about Palestine, we always say that it's a Palestinian struggle, an Arab struggle, and an international struggle. Now, many of the organizations that are leading the resistance today would also classify that as an Islamic struggle. And we might also classify it as a regional struggle that has relevance to forces in the region that are not necessarily Arab countries, but are also but are absolutely part of the region, for example, such as Iran, um, who definitely have an interest in seeing a region that's free of US imperialism and free of US control and domination. Um, and so when we speak about the axis of resistance, we're in many ways talking about all of the forces in the region that have come together and that have developed an alliance to reject US imperialism and reject imperialist domination of the region. So obviously, we're certainly talking about the Lebanese resistance, we're talking about Hezbollah, the, co the commitment that the Lebanese resistance has had throughout this entire time, uh, not only to the liberation of Lebanon from Zionism, but to the liberation of Palestine as well. Um, right now, the Lebanese resistance is waging a battle on the northern border of Palestine that has caused significant damage, that has emptied settlements in the north of Palestine and emptied military bases in the north of Palestine. That has been a significant contribution to the resistance in this battle, um, in addition to everything else that we've already discussed. Of course, 
we were just speaking about Yemen and the Ansar law movement, which is you know, also representative of the legitimate government of over 80% of the people of Yemen um, and the armed forces of Yemen that are essentially taking it upon themselves, taking up the responsibility for that matter under international law, which has been completely abandoned by all of the imperialist powers um, to actually stop a genocide that is in the process of taking place. And they've done that by cutting off access to the Red Sea for, Zion for Zionist ships and for Zionist shipping, and now the United States and Britain, because their immediate response was to begin warfare upon Yemen. Um, so when we speak about the Ansar Allah movement, we speak about Hezbollah, these are forces that are directly involved in this battle that is taking place today. This isn't just a battle taking place in Gaza, and it's not just a place a battle taking place in Palestine. Um, this is a battle for the entire region. Now, of course, we're also talking about the resistance movements in Iraq. We're also talking about resistance movements and people of Syria. Um, and we're also talking about Iran as a nation. Uh, on the side of the Palestinian people intervening and building a movement of resistance to free this entire region, to free Palestine from Zionism, but to free the region from U.S. imperialism. When we say October 7th changed the world, one of the reasons why we might say that is because on October 7th, we saw the potential of a future for Palestine liberated from Zionism by the force of the resistance. And what that also showed was the potential for liberating the region from imperialism, that all of the sanctions, the anti-terror laws, the blockades, the ongoing genocide for over 75 years, the colonization, the attempt to divert the Arab nation into internal warfare and strife rather than conflict with Zionism and imperialism, that all of these things had failed and that Palestine was once again, as it has always been, the compass of the region towards liberation. Now, when we speak about the axis of resistance, we're usually very specifically speaking about these countries. But it's also one of the reasons why we need to speak about a broader front of resistance. Because when we talk about our global movements for liberation, when we talk about the countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America that are standing up for Palestine, when we look at what's happening um, from Venezuela to Cuba to Nicaragua pursuing Germany in the International Court of Justice to even things like the case that's South Africa is bringing, what we're also seeing is an international front of resistance that is being built on multiple levels with these resistance forces at the core of defending humanity. And so the question for us who are organizing, particularly in North America, in the belly of the beast, in the heart of the imperial core, is how do we get organized and use the organizing that we're doing in order to be a meaningful part of that global front of resistance, that we can actually be of service in a moral, political way to the resistance movements that are on the front lines, fighting Zionism, fighting imperialism, and fighting for a future that means a future of liberation for humanity rather than one of continued exploitation, hegemony, and domination. I yeah, have one last part on the great the point expounded on by Comrade Charlotte are two different quotes. There's one quote by uh, Mao who said, you're not, one, you're not two million Palestinians fighting Israel, you're 100 million Arabs, you must think and act according to that basis. And then from Ghassan Kamafani, the PFL Peace Revolutionary Martyr, who said, the Palestinian cause is not just the cause of the Palestinian people, but all oppressed peoples everywhere. It's truly a glo global fight and you know, the internationalism that we've seen since October 7th really shows that. And I'd also just like to, um, you know, add, when we look at the countries that are vilified by the U.S., you know, countries like Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Iran, we have to understand that there's a reason that they're doing that. There's a reason that Saudi Arabia can kill a journalist uh, in plain view in their embassy, and that doesn't threaten their relationship with the U.S. Meanwhile, you know, the U.S. wants to um, inflict regime change in Syria. They want to... Uh, you know, uh, push down the uh, unsettled law movement in Yemen. And it's because these countries, um, as, you know, some uh, folks have mentioned, these are the material and financial lifeline of the Palestinian resistance. They have provided the counterweight to U.S. hegemony in the region, not just on the Palestinian struggle, but rolling back the influence of American and Western influence 
and domination in the region generally. Without the axis of resistance, we would see a domination of American and Zionist influence in, in the region in the same way we see its influence in the Gulf, Egypt, and Jordan today, um, contra contrary to what you know, what many of the people of those countries want. Um, their, their leaders, their governments are bought out. And this is why when we protest, we protest the Egyptian embassy. We protest um, the, uh, you know, the Gulf countries. Um, it's important to understand that Iran has specifically played a role in supporting the Palestinian resistance on a military level. Uh, while the resistance has been able to independently develop its capacity to resist through indigenous means, as, as Michael mentioned, the indigenous made um, rockets, I like that. <laughs> um, you know, like taking munitions from sunken British World War II ships or converting settler plumbing pipes into weapons. So some of the, literally the, the pipes that the settlers left behind in Gaza, they use that, you know, uh, to make weapons to fight for the Palestinian resistance. Um, a lot of a lot of the the things that Palestinians are, or the means that Palestinians have to resist um, come from Iran, and a lot of the ways our people have been able to protect themselves came from the Iranian people. And it's past time to recognize this. It's not for no reason that the U.S. has been undermining Iran for decades, and a lot of that has to do with their assistance to the Palestinian people. Um, you know, Charlotte talked about Lebanon, and we understand that the IDF is unable to fully deploy the the weight of its military machine against Gaza because the Lebanese have proven to be a serious threat that can independently threaten the existence of the Zionist project. Um, there's a lot to be said about Yemen from a geopolitical and logistics framework. The end of Israel from being able to use the Red Sea for trade and military logistics is a serious development that deserves serious attention. The Yemenis were the first people in history to use anti-ship ballistic missiles, and we know that route is now close to the Zionists. They now threaten to close the Indian Ocean to Zionist traffic as well, but time will tell on that front. The Iraqis are working on closing the Mediterranean route to the Zionists. They have claimed several drone attacks on Haifa port, which is the Zionist biggest port, which would effectively besiege Israel from any maritime route whatsoever. And so the importance of this access can't be overstated. The exact politics of these organizations have been attacked and debated for decades even from people from within the Palestine um, movement itself. But fundamentally, the principle of a united front is what we're interested in. We don't enter united fronts agreeing with every partner on every single issue. We enter united fronts to confront the primary contradictions in the region, which in this case is Zionism and U.S. imperialism. And the axis of resistance has proven itself many times over, at least much more than Twitter academics and Western... <laughs> who slander their, their resistance movements in the service of U.S. imperialism. We saw this during um, the early SJP student movement, where the movement was split in half due to the ongoing Syrian war, which served Zionism and U.S. imperialism, ultimately. Um, I'm glad to say that contradiction seems to have kind of resolved itself, but many more have taken in its place. So understand that they will use Syria, they will use Iran, they will use all of these things, you know, to divide us. And then when we talk about the axis of resistance, it's also... Um, important to look at the influence of Russia and China and their support to these countries as well. And now, you know, the Zionists are trying to spin it. Oh, Russia and China vetoed uh, a ceasefire resolution. No, it wasn't a ceasefire resolution. Um, and it's it's important, the fact that they're actually standing with us um, against us and rejecting, you know, that narrative. So, you know, the demonization of all of these countries um, is ultimately connected to their support or connection to the axis of resistance and support of Palestine. And we shouldn't be fooled by propaganda meant to undermine that. Thank you guys so much for that. It seems like from what you guys are saying that um, a lot of the countries being demonized are ones that cannot be controlled by the US and Israel. All right, and um, so next we got our next question is, um, how have the resistance tactics and demographics changed over time? Um, what role have the diaspora and allied forces historically played? And what role do they play now? Um, and I guess you guys could see, if any of you guys could answer these questions first. Can I give it a stab? <laughs> I think I'm going to get it too. Yeah, 100%. If, well, I'll go first. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I want to go back to something that was mentioned earlier as well about um, certain groups being labeled uh, as FTOs or, or designated terrorist organizations. 
and the impact that that has had on the transnational nature of the struggle, um, the impact that that has had on uh, the connection of the diaspora to people back home in Palestine. Um, and I, I just want to like, you know, we're all, we're all pretty young, uh, but like, you know, we, none of us really lived in a time when these organizations weren't designated uh, terrorist organizations. And I think that that's more important than people give it credit for. Um, 1997, I think, was the year when almost every Palestinian faction that rejected Oslo was designated by the United States. Quickly afterwards, all of the countries in the EU followed suit, etc. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, in the 70s and the 60s, you had these well, 70s and 80s, I'll say, you had these transnational bodies that were built up of Palestinians who had been exiled or Palestinians from, you know, the camps who had, had moved abroad for education, et cetera, things like that, who had solid connections to the struggle back home through their families, um, who were connected to the leaderships of, the, of these struggles um, and leaderships of the parties, actually, because there was no international barrier to doing that that would put you in prison immediately. So we had groups like GUPS, a uh, General Union of Palestinian Students, and also the General Union of Palestinian Women, who maintained really strong transnational connections from the diaspora to the homeland. Um, and in the case of GUPS, GUPS was actually a wing of the PLO, officially. Um, and 1997 put a wall in front of that process. Now, you know, the movement abroad and the movement in the United States has to worry about being imprisoned for life for, for affiliation with a, a, you know, an FTO, if they so much as contact mm -hmm. a, a representative or an individual from any of the legitimate political parties that are inside of Palestine. Holy land God. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a, a, a significant lawfare tactic that has been leveraged against so many individuals, whether based like, with basis or with no basis in the case of the Holy Land Five, yeah. baseless accusations. But this, this designation and this um, label that the United States and, and other countries have been able to use to circumvent what should be human rights law. But of course, I mean, if you make the rules, you can change them whenever you want. So it, it's sort of, it's it's transformed the movement in a way that has, has, has created a, a significant break between what we consider the revolutionary period and the current, the, the modern era or what we're in right now. And I think that, that that wall is a hurdle that is sort of, constantly looming in front of us as we try and fight for Palestinian liberation from here, it also puts a wall in front of, you know, joint struggle partners in all of the various liberation struggles around the world who are also trying to contribute to the struggle for Palestinian liberation, but they also face this intense criminalization on a, in an international level. Um, so I, I want to, you know, start out with that. I think that's a really significant development. Most of it yeah, so I um, want to contribute to this discussion. I know Caleb's going to speak a little bit more maybe about some of the broader Palestinian institutions and, and the, the movement of the diaspora. But I do want to uh, kind of hone in a little bit on this discussion of anti-terrorism laws and how that intersects with the Oslo process and NGOization, because this isn't just like, this wasn't a situation where these organizations and institutions were healthy and in good shape when those terrorist designations came out in, 19, in the 1996-97 period. This was a period in which those institutions had already basically been demolished due to Oslo. And the purpose of the anti-terrorism legislation was essentially to, as you said, Sean, to prevent an alternative from developing because the organizations that were placed on the FTO list. So if we look at the original executive order, which came out in 1995, this executive order specifically said that it was designating organizations that posed a danger to the Middle East peace process. In other words, to the Oslo process. So the organizations that were listed were essentially those organizations that refused to um, be part of the Oslo process. So Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Islamic Jihad movement, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad movement, the Popular Front, uh, the initial... There's an interesting story about the DFLP and the terrorism list, but maybe that is a little too far afield for this discussion. But um, 
there, the DFLP, uh, all of the organizations that were part of the rejectionist front were and and the Lebanese resistance were labeled as foreign terrorist organizations. And initially, that was just a financial sanction, and then it became a criminal sanction in 1997. Um, because what had already happened is that the PLO institutions outside Palestine had been drained of their resources, their membership, their finances, and their ability to organize post-1993. And so this was meant as essentially, uh, it was meant to strike a blow to ensure that there would be no PLO, there would only be the Palestinian Authority, and that what used to be called the PLO and what is still called the PLO would be uh, transformed into, a pro into an, an entity, not for the liberation of Palestine, but for the maintenance of the Oslo process, and that any alternative to the Oslo process would be, de would be fundamentally criminalized and attacked. And so... This has, as you correctly stated, posed an obstacle, but it's also gone hand in hand with NGOization because the criminalization didn't come by itself. The Oslo process also came with the creation of hundreds of NGOs. In fact, Palestine has the greatest number of NGOs per capita. Now, there are a number of NGOs that do great work in Palestine. This isn't meant to be an attack on everybody who's part of a human rights institution in Palestine or something like that. But the fact is that NGOs were created as an alternative to revolutionary political parties and revolutionary organizations. And they were created in order to channel the energies of the Palestinian people into a form that would always require a new grant from the European Union, which could be revoked at any time. And what we see if we look at the past 30 years is that initially they were quite lax with their grants. There were no political conditions on who was employed by the organization or institution and very few conditions on what was said by the institution. But what we saw over the years is that now there is an intense amount of political conditioning that's been adopted by the United States and the European Union, yes, the two primary enemies of Palestine are also the two primary funders for which the Palestinian Authority and NGOs rely upon. Um, and now they've imposed heavy political conditions. So now not only have they separated these institutions from being popular institutions associated with parties to being NGOs with no connection, they also are now conditioning it so much that you can't even hire employees that have a Palestinian political affiliation. Right. So now if you hire employees that have a Palestinian political affiliation, you can lose your funding. You will no longer exist. And all of this is meant as a way of sanctioning the resistance. Um, so if we this entire discussion about UNRWA funding, for example, is literally about the idea that Palestinian institutions and in this case, international institutions, uh, can that if you are a member of a Palestinian political party or resistance organization, you should not be able to work and your family should not be able to work and you must starve. And that's the mandate that's being offered by the United States and its partners. So this also poses the question to us, which is how do we resist that? Because we can't simply say, oh, well, they're an FTO, so then it's illegal. We have to really, it's important for us to come together to to do everything that we can to make support for the resistance as mass-based as pop and as popular as possible, because the more that we're able to do that, the less the state is able to pursue kind of unjust persecution prosecutions. Material support does have a meaning in that it's meant to be material. Yes, the state wishes to expand the definition of that to comprise everything and anything in the world. However, it does not comprise moral and political support. It's, it does not. The there is this attempt in in that's never been tested in an actual case to say that say doing a campaign if you're being coordinated by the FTO could be considered material support, um, and that the state might want to try to pursue this kind of thing in order to frighten and suppress the movement. But the greater the support for the resistance is, the lesser their ability to pursue such a strategy is, which is why it is important to popularize campaigns to get to scrap the US terror list entirely, or at the very least, to get Palestinian, Lebanese, uh, Yemeni, Filipino, and other revolutionary organizations off the terror list, because that's a weapon that's being used against 
against the Palestinian people, against the Arab people, and against the solidarity movement as a whole, um, and in order to kind of fundamentally deform the politics of the movement. Um, there's a lot more to be said about this, and I'd love to continue this discussion later, but I know that there's a lot more stuff to be said about this fundamental question about resurrecting Palestinian political organizing and diaspora, um, and I, it would be great to hear more about that. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought there was some someone before me. Um, okay. Uh, I just say a few points on this very important issue, and that is any struggle, whether it's Palestinian struggle or any other struggle, it really depends on so many factors, as you all know, particularly the balance of power internationally and regionally, and also the balance of power within the Palestinian National Liberation Movement itself. So, for example, Palestinians were the main backers and funders of the Iranian movement before the revolution of 1979. We were the ones who were giving them weapons and money. At the same time, we were also the main backers and funders of the South African struggle and their military wings of the ANC in terms of uh, weapons, money, training. We have opened military camps for our brothers and sisters in the Kurdish uh, movement at, at one point of time in our, uh, you know, in, in Lebanon. Uh, and every national liberation movement, including black liberation movement in the United States. And so Palestinians were playing a leadership role at that time, uh, you know, in a world where you have a socialist camp led by the Soviet Union and uh, another camp led by the United States. Uh, and if we take, for example, certain tactics that the Palestinian movement have uh, practiced, take, for example, hijacking airplanes. It was one of the most important tactics that the Palestinian resistance have uh, engaged in. And not one single person was injured or killed in all of these operations. Yet when you see Hollywood movies, you think that, you know, Palestinians have killed thousands of people in these operations. Not one single person was injured because the goals behind these tactics was actually to address the Palestinian people cause, uh, pain, why they struggle. And the very, these questions that you are asking today in this panel, what Palestinians are fighting for, what is their objectives. These were means for Palestinians to explain to the world their struggle. And if it wasn't for these tactics, we would never heard of Leila Khalid, for example, and other Palestinian women who led these kind of uh, heroic operations uh, that introduced the Palestinian questions to the world. If you take, for example, the um, speeches that were given uh, to the people in the airplanes by Palestinian fighters and these documents, when you read them, they're all about what is our struggle is, is about. And it's also important to, I think, see that the Palestinian diaspora, uh, especially after the establishment of the PLO, um, all Palestinian social sectors, whether students, as it was mentioned, there were GAPs or the women organizations, workers, teachers, uh, doctors, and so on and so forth, uh, they were engaged in the struggle as what we call basis of the revolution. Uh, today, Palestinians don't use the word revolution. They use more the word resistance. But I think after October 7th, Palestinians have revived their revolution because they have now engaged in not just defending uh, themselves and their existence, but also we are moving towards the being the um, taking initiatives, uh, tactical defensive uh, kind of approach. And also we saw that uh, these tactics that the resistance adopted, especially since uh, May 2021 uh, during uh, civil goods battle. Um, I also want to say that, you know, 
the balance of power within the Palestinian National Liberation Movement was always in favor of the right-wing trend of the movement, which is led by Fatah. And the reason of that is because Arab regimes wanted to support a nationalist trend that wanted to just focus on the Palestinian question and their um, relationship to the Arab region and to the international struggle wasn't exactly, uh, you know, based on an anti-imperialist understanding and anti-colonialist understanding. For Yasser Arafat, for example, uh, he, you know, he had his own ideas, but we cannot, we cannot see that school of thought. We saw where it led us. It led us to Oslo. That's why it's very important for Palestinians when they are rebuilding their revolution and their institutions in the diaspora to always be uh, aware uh, that the leadership of the resistance, the leadership of the movement has to come from the popular classes, the working classes, the most the impoverished classes, because these are very, very important issues uh, that will uh, secure the line of the revolution and the line uh, of the uh, resistance. That's all. Thank you. Um, so this is our last question uh, for the panel discussion. I know we talked a little bit about um, the diaspora's role in resistance tactics. Um, but as organizers and students in the belly of the beast, what strategies and tactics um, should we take up in acts of solidarity for the Palestinian resistance? And sorry, if we can keep this a little more brief, just because we have Q&A questions in the Slido. So yeah, if anyone wants to start. Just to really emphasize one of the last points that um, Khaled brought up, you know, just as Palestinian society in Palestine has been NGOIs, our movement is facing the same, you know, crisis here. So, you know, um, not all organizations are the same. Not everyone is a 501c3 certified organization. You know, there is a difference between grassroots organizations that are, um, you know, organize it, that are that are trying to organize the diaspora here, that are trying to organize Palestinians in exile um, to revitalize their revolutionary spirit in pursuit of a free homeland and organizations that are getting, you know, funded um, by sometimes uh, the same organizations that fund literally Zionist organizations, like the New Israel Fund, and I won't name names here, but a lot of the organizations that, you know, are, are so-called part and parcel of the Palestine movement are literally funded by the New Israel Fund, who, who I think funds J Street also, I think, and a lot of other, you know, Zionist things like that. And so it's, it's put us in a position where, we don't want to do like public infighting in front of Zionists, but you know our interests are different. There are people who are ben are could be benefiting, you know, off of this moment by getting increased grants and and things like that to their organizations. And then there are people who are being banned in Germany, like Samadun, who are being banned off of Instagram, like within our lifetime, um, who are being who are facing way more police repression for a reason. The police have straight up told us. There's three times the amount of police at our protests than other Palestine pro protests. And why can't we be like the other guys and get permits and fall in line? So there's going to be a lot of this um, LARPing, like live action, uh, <laughs> role playing. Uh, you know, everyone's acting like a revolutionary and they'll use the sloganeering and they'll talk. They'll dress the same and they'll use a lot of the chants that we make. But it doesn't lead to the same thing. So don't just blindly support and follow and that doesn't mean that you need to go like um attack these organizations or call them out but you know understand that especially as students when you have access to places like these to resources like this to the legitimate the le legitimization that like co that comes with like speaking at a university that you don't fall into uplifting um the orgs or the people who will who will like wholesale sell who will wholesale sell us out who's goal will to you know be to replace us and i and that's not you know about like centering us or anything like that but understanding that um you know the, the revolution will not be funded um ngos will not bring the path of resistance they're good they're needed they could be helpful 
as a supplement to the actual revolutionaries leading the work, and they shouldn't be leading it. They shouldn't be the ones putting themselves on the forefront um, as leading it. You know, the NGOization of Palestinian society is, is one of the biggest impediments to why we're not free today, because we are united in resistance. And, you know, they, what would they do to revolutionaries? They killed them. Now they just buy them out. And they come cheap, you know, <laughs> uh, at least here in the U.S. So, um, you know, keep that in mind um, and, and don't, uh, you know, don't acquiesce to the idea, well, oh, they're considered um, terrorist organizations, so we shouldn't talk about resistance. You know, there have been organizations since October 7th, uh, and I'm not going to name names, but, you know, kind of putting themselves out on the front line, literally telling me. You, we want you. We want to invite you to speak, but you can't mention October seventh. You can't mention resistance. Straight up. Actually, now they mention resistance. Now, now they'll talk about it three months later or, or five months later because they saw we did it. We got away with it. We got support for it. You know, and we're kind of like the test subjects or the guinea pigs. We're going to put ourselves out on the line, and you know, if people are okay with it, then they'll jump on it. You know, later. So you know, always um, try to support those that are, that are the most advanced. And, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be backed into a corner. You know, we thought, like, look at, like, post 9-11. You never thought you would see Muslims um, and, and Arabs and our allies, you know, having protests, screaming in the streets, like, Allahu Akbar, which we do now. Mm -hmm. And, like, and and now even the NGO allied organizations who told us we shouldn't have religious chants or we shouldn't um, say things in Arabic or we shouldn't chant about resistance, are now forced to adopt those same exact things because they are taken up by the masses and they are so popular. Mm -hmm. The masses are actually so far in advance of what so many of these NGOs do. And I, every time people thank me, I tell them, don't thank me because you know what I'm saying is what your mom and dad have been telling you in your house since you were little kids. And they can they can agree to that. So be brave, be courageous. Um, and, you know, don't... Uh, I'm not going to say don't get yourself in trouble because we're all getting in trouble all the time, <laughs> all the time here. But, you know, understand that all of these stigmas that they put against us, um, they, these are social things and they can be fought back against too. And the masses are on our side and we outnumber them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Can I? Yeah, yeah. Tough to follow. Tough to follow. <laughs> um, I just want to say I, I heavily back everything that Nadine has just said. I also want to bring up another element to this, which is um, what the, let's say, intermediate advance sectors of the above ground movement are capable of doing and where the gaps have been in such a critical moment, right? And, I, you know, I'm here speaking on behalf of a national SJP. Um, for Two decades, right? SJPs have been pursuing divestment, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It's BDS. New York City SJP actually released a, a scathing article on the BDS ceiling, mm -hmm. which was the idea that BDS is the only, it's the end, it's the end point of the movement here, right? It's mm -hmm. as far as we can go after that, pack it up. Your, your, the article was correct, right? That, that It's not the ceiling. There's so much more to be doing. Um, BDS is a way to control a movement that has so much potential and so much power behind it, but is redirected into the acceptable channels. It's really respectability politics. But on the other hand, it's been 19 years since the BNC was formed and BDS was launched as a Palestinian campaign. We have not divested, we have not boycotted, and we have not sanctioned. And I think that this is important for us to remember that, of course, there is no BDS ceiling. There is so much more work to be done. And yet also, we haven't accomplished what's on the floor. And I think it's really important that we all ground ourselves in the, the possibilities that are in front of us, the power that we've built over the past several decades, the power that diaspora has, the communities that have been strengthened, uh, despite all of the setbacks that they've encountered, 9-11, uh, the war on terror, the repression that the Muslim community in this country has endured, right? But we have this power, and it's time to use it. So yeah, BDS ceiling doesn't exist. However, BDS is a good step one. And I think all of these SJPs that are currently trying to push divestment and push through these demands on campus, totally above ground, totally within the bounds of the institutions that we all know are corrupt, it's step one. And I think, uh, you know, I want to salute 
Columbia, SJP, and, and Blood, who are who are taking on this work at Columbia. So, and and acknowledge that y'all are hosting us here today for this com uh, conference. <laughs> yeah. this, um, and you know, <laughs> <panel. laughs> but I, I want to say that you know it's, it's step one, and I think that uh, people are again kindly finally coming around to this conclusion that mm -hmm. yes, step one needs to happen. There's more work to be done, and as you said, the advanced elements of this movement are propelling us forward, mm -hmm. and you know. It's unfortunate that sometimes some folks are 10 years ahead of the rest of the movement, but now we're catching up. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, they can go first. It's... Charlotte Khaled, do you guys have anything to add? Thank you to speak. Oh, Charlotte Khaled, do you guys have anything to add? I wanted to say a couple of points. Uh... Uh, some of them are actually kind of personal when it comes to the student movement and the boycott movement. You know, I spent my youth years in New York and I worked very much near Columbia University, but I was a worker and I was never part of the student movement. However, we always felt as workers, uh, youth, that we are part of the student movement, although we weren't students because there were always this bridge between student work and community work. I have attended so many lectures by, you know, organized by the Arab Student Club, uh, Club in, in Columbia University, where I saw Edward Said speaking and, uh, you know, fight with him when I was 16 years old. And so, <laughs> you know, and debate with Edward Said. And so I think it's really important for us to build these bridges between the student movement and other struggles as well within the campus and outside our campus border. They would love, our enemies would love to see students only in campus uh, and not be engaged, you know, um, in building alliances with the with the workers and with unions and, and other. the other thing I wanted to say is that sometimes I feel that there is two uh, sets of discussions and priorities one in Palestine like when I speak to my friends and brothers in Hamas Islamic Jihad you know the PFLP in Gaza these days especially after October 7th we talk about different things that has nothing to do with our movement outside almost because people in Gaza now they don't care about what Biden says and what Kamala Harris says and they can care less about you know some of these uh things that is happening in the media or all these useless debates sometimes that happens in in the media what they're focused on is to actually stop the Israeli aggression and defeat Israel and, and so when they see students organizing outside uh, Palestine, they really feel that they are being backed as a resistance and they're being supported. Every demonstration in New York matters for Gaza way more than, uh, you know, all these uh, nonsense debates that happen in mainstream media. Uh, so your work is so important to the resistance in Gaza than more than ever. And on the boycott, uh, uh, you know, I believe that there should be a boycott movement, but it should not be limited to, you know, BDS. I don't see people in Palestine talking about BDS, not even outside since October 7th. No one is talking about this because, as it was mentioned, um, it's a tactic and it cannot be replacing the liberation movement, cannot replace the student movement. It's just one item on the agenda that Palestinians and their ally, allies can use as a, uh, as you know, to support their uh, struggle. Just like sometimes when we mention international law, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this context, not because we feel that international law could liberate Palestine for the past 75 years, uh, that didn't happen. And, you know, the UN would issue countless numbers of resolutions that supports the Palestinian people struggle. In fact, the International Day of Solidarity with Palestine was in May 15th. It was not in November 29th. You know, people would 
gather around the world saying that May 15th, you know, on May 15th, on the Nakba day, uh, uh, that we stand with the Palestinian people, struggle for their uh, liberation and for their rights. And these things change. You know, Zionism used to be, uh, there's a resolution uh, by the United Nations that Zionism is a form of racism. And then that was changed after, you know, the balance of power changed. And so in 1989, in 1990, uh, you know, Israel started waging campaigns to remove that article that considers Zionism a form of racism. And they give it to Israel as a reward to attend the Madrid conference, you know, in 1991. So we know that we cannot only depend on these uh, uh, tactics as a, a strategy for uh, liberation. I just wanted to say these few points. I just that I feel that it's important not to look at what is in our hands now and be kind of prisoners of the moment, but to be strategic and to be patient as well. Uh, you know, Iranians, our brothers and, uh, and sisters in Iran have. Uh, have something called the strategic patient, uh, you know, and we should also, you know, read about how to actually be patient and not look on like solutions, what we need now, uh, and 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 accept what it, they are offering for us just because we are under pressure. Um, it's. Uh, I, I think also, you know, it's really important what's happening because although Israel is committing genocide and war crimes against our people in Gaza, we do feel that there are other ideas that it's coming of how to fight back uh, internationally and, uh, you know, boycott and, and other uh, issues as well. Thank you. It's okay. Uh, we just want to move on just so we can get to the uh, questions from the uh, the audience. Um, so one of the questions is pertaining to the uh, Samidim people. Um, can you share about what you meant in your piece? Gaza is not just a location, it is a strategy. Well, so the essence of that argument was that what happened in Gaza isn't just what they do to Gaza, but they do it globally. Uh, an important part about that fact was you could see it across the world, uh, especially here in the U.S. border. You're seeing the kind of creation between Latin America and the U.S. as us versus them. It has always been there, but now you're seeing it ramp up even more. Uh, the militarization of the border, the rhetoric against the rhetoric of war against Latin American countries has grown exponentially in just the recent decade, and that's just part of like this kind of regime of. Uh, as kind of the crisis of imperialism deepens, you're seeing the contradictions grow between the global south and the third, the third world and the first and second world. And the first and second world are going to these more, you know, chauvinistic or going to these more openly terroristic uh, methods of blockade, of kind of concentration, of ghettoization. And we've seen this also historically too. Like they did it in Malaysia to try and stop the communist rebellion there. They did it in Vietnam to try and stop the communist rebellion there too. And now you're seeing it in Gaza. In Gaza, they're using it to perfect it across the globe. Anyone else have to answer? Maybe people on Zoom? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll contribute to the discussion. This was a Samadine NYNJ statement. Happy to put a link in the chat for, um, for people who'd like to read this statement. But fundamentally, what the statement is about is just like what Michael said, which was the idea that there is a war being waged upon the working class of the world, um, which largely is the global south. And there's also a resistance that's taking place. And that resistance is being led by the Palestinian resistance, the Yemeni resistance, the Lebanese resistance, all of the resistance forces in the region who are fighting back for a different future for humanity. And that one of the ways in which we're seeing that implemented on even a smaller scale, because there's different levels of this repression and attack everywhere, is through these mechanisms of repression. So that ranges from the NYPD beating up people in the streets of New York uh, for having a protest for Palestine. Palestine. Um, this also to the NYPD engaging in its regular practices of intimidation, um, killing and assaults against 
against black communities, against racialized communities, against oppressed communities in New York and elsewhere um, that goes to the U.S.'s southern border that certainly goes to this level of surveillance that we're seeing these reports that Columbia is surveilling students' use of Wi-Fi to keep an eye on what's happening in terms of, of protest organizing, that this is essentially using the tactics that are being used um, in occupied Palestine as a testing ground, essentially, for new mechanisms of warfare and repression around the world, which has always been part of the imperial collaboration with the Zionist project um, and the imperial sponsor imperialist sponsorship of the Zionist project. But, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in Germany happening right now is that comrades who are being repressed for their organizing in the Palestine movement are seeing threats against their families. So, for example, the mothers and sisters of activists who are organizing for Palestine are receiving notices from the government that their refugee status is going to be is going to be uh, stripped and they're going to be deported from the country. This is a form of collective punishment of targeting families, and it's something that we see every day taking place in Palestine when the occupation forces invade a home and will uh, seize someone's mother and sisters in an attempt to coerce them into giving themselves up or into uh, someone into revealing some kind of information. Uh, this is a form of uh, psychological torture being weighed against the Palestinian population. And so we're seeing that both inside and outside Palestine, and not just extending to Palestinians, but to all of the peoples of the world who are confronting imperialism and who must confront imperialism in order to see a better future for humanity. Um, so I think this question was answered a little bit by Nirdeen, um, but one of the questions that was submitted was, what do you think are the biggest gaps in the international solidarity movement right now, specifically in North America? Okay. I think a big part of it is uh, popular participation. A lot of the time, a lot of you know, Palestine organizing can feel like, as Heather was pointing out, isolated on the campus, and that's something they want. But something we really need to do is to go amongst oppressed people, to go amongst workers, uh, and actually, you know, build towards popular organization. Because one of the most important parts of the lifeline to the Zionist entity is the economic, uh, is the economic factor, the mm -hmm. shipments to them, not just the weapons but the food. And if we could have, say, unions boycotting that, people going on strikes, militantly opposing that, we could really see a dent. And it's also the implicit thing is. Uh, someone who sees their neighborhood police because they're foreign working class and knows what it's like to get beaten just for being someone who's poor can also sympathize with someone in the West Bank who knows what it's like to get their neighborhood police getting beaten by the IOF. So the fact of the matter is the link is there and we just need to unite it. Anyone else like to answer this? Maybe Charlotte um, or the other speakers? Maybe I'll just... Uh... I'll just add that, um, you know, I think like just going back to divestment and stuff like that, just to clarify for when Sean's saying not one school is divested. Yeah, no, you, no I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it is true because they divest on paper, right? Like they pass a divestment resolution, CUNY Law, BDS, uh, CUNY Law, which I graduated from, we divested, but not actually. We just like the students basically recommended that we should divest. We voted on it. The board of the board is not going to divest. Not one single board of any school has ever actually divested or pulled funds from Israel or cut off relationships or cut off funding. What we did is just to create a problem for the school where if they invite an Israeli scholar, which they did after we passed divestment, that it would be like a shit show for them, that people would ho have something to hold them accountable to that. Now we have this piece of paper that says all of the students agree on this and you're violating that. So, you know, that's the purpose of it. It's to politicize your campus environment. So, you know, I think that that's good. It's a good way to introduce Palestine to people who may have never, you know, heard about it before. But, you know, at the times that we are at now, you know, it's it's really dangerous to let BDS or any of these city council yeah. resolutions that people are trying to pass. Like, you can't think of those alone as wins. You know, I see like, People screaming and shot, shouting and hollering when, oh, their city council or their whatever, their school, like, passed whatever. You're not really, like, it's, symbolically it's good, but, you you know, when you treat that as a win, as the ultimate win, and then everybody packs up and goes home, you're derailing the movement. 
So understand that these are little things that we can do to help advance our cause, but don't, you know, don't get stuck there and don't present it as the most important, you know, thing in the universe that needs to be done right now, which I see like, you know, a lot of student movements and a lot of students doing and people get excited and that's fine. But, you know, this is why we started within our lifetime. Within our lifetime initially was um, NYCSJP, which was a combination of student organizations um, in New York City at the time that did not want to be isolated to the campus. That we understand that Palestinians didn't need to come to four wall um, auditorium, like panel discussions about why Palestine should be free. They already knew that. We needed to use our resources and knowledge and skills to empower them to be able to say that effectively and, you know, through protests and through, you know, community organizing. So I really do want to emphasize, you know, different speakers talked about this in different modes, community organizing and linking, um, you know, like what Khaled said, linking the student movement um, to outside of that. And don't be discouraged, right? At the time, Columbia actually did not want to be a part of NYCSJP. I know you guys weren't there. And then they're like, they're like, we have so many tests. Columbia is so hard. It's an Ivy League. You guys go to cuties. You guys may have time. <laughs> Columbia, we're so smart. We can't, we can't do like outside work. And look where we are right now. I was on National SJP and I was actually kicked out for being too radical. And now I'm sitting <laughs> in Columbia University next to representative from NSJP today because, you know, people will understand, you know, these things. So push as far as you can, even when you feel like everyone's against you. Th this is what it means to be a Palestinian, what it means to fight for the Palestinian struggle. They want us to feel like we're alone and that we're isolated. But in actuality, the world has our back. The world supports us. We need to be brave um, to really make that visible. <laughs> So one thing I wanted to just kind of add in this discussion, I agree with everything that everybody already said, but it's about the conversation that we're having today, uh, which is about resistance. And it's awesome that we're having this conversation today. And it's great, like what we're seeing, for example, um, in demonstrations. I mean, when we go and speak at a demonstration, right? Like we get the loudest cheers when we talk about Yemen, Lebanon, and the resistance um, around the region. And when we speak about the Palestinian armed resistance, like that we notice this time and time again, right? And this is happening in various places across North America. I mean, it's not like Vancouver is unique in that regard. Um, but one of the things that I think it's really important, right, is that, and it is a gap to a certain extent, is that a lot of times these conversations about the resistance, we are afraid because of all of the reasons that have been created by the state specifically to make us afraid to put that in the forefront because we're worried that it's going to alienate people and we're worried that it's going to be like not as mass as as, as using another slogan but that's not really what we're seeing right in practice so if that's not the experience that we're actually having then we shouldn't assume what our enemy wants us to assume is true about the people and we shouldn't assume that people are put off by resistance um, we can actually take a look at Western society and say that this is in fact not a society that is appalled by violence. This is a society that this is not a society that is a this is not a society that is appalled by violence. Um, and of course, too much of what we see is reactionary violence and re violence of the oppressor and white supremacist violence and the violence of capitalist exploitation and the violence of imperialist occupations and wars and invasions. But it's also certainly true that this is a society that is full of people and full of narratives and histories of revolutionary resistance and resilience um, and stories of victory and struggle. And so... It is incumbent on us that when we do go out and speak at demonstrations and we do go out and organize to say that we stand with the Palestinian armed resistance and that we support them and that this is a struggle that we want to be part of um, and that this is not this is not illegal. This is not material support. This is purely moral and political support. So and I, I'm saying that to be you know very clear on the legal side as well. This is moral and political support, which we have every right to have and we have every right to engage in and we have a responsibility to do it right because the resistance are the those who are on the front lines 
uh, defending Palestine and really defending all of us. I mean, what happened on October 7th was that all the imperialist forces started flocking to Tel Aviv at the same time that settlers were looking for plane tickets to get out of occupied Palestine because they saw the future of the downfall of imperialism and were determined to do anything to stop it. And so the action that the Palestinian resistance undertook on the 7th of October was an earth-shattering undertaking. They actually took the necessary action and they took an action that they understood as necessary in order to make change. And so the very least that we can do here is to not equivocate about who the forces are that are fighting this battle. And to speak a very, like, yes, it's absolutely absurd the number of things that Zionists claim are Hamas. Yes, it's absolutely absurd and ridiculous. But the fact is that Hamas is a mass Palestinian movement that is in a leadership role in the liberation struggle right now. And there oh. is nothing wrong with uh, being a member of Hamas, being a leader of Hamas, being a fighter in Hamas. These are the people that are on the front lines defending Palestine and fighting for its liberation. And so that's the kind of I, I mean, I, I don't want to reduce the struggle from the material to the verbal or to the moral, but it is actually necessary for us to do this if we're going to build an international popular cradle of the resistance to be alongside that which is Palestinian and that which is Arab and that which is regional. Um, and, and just to say, in addition, the work that's being done to directly confront arms factories, like by Palestine Action in Britain and some of the Palestine Action stuff that's been moved here, uh, that's come here. There's now four folks in New Hampshire that are facing major charges and a trial coming soon because they're working to actually bring that direct confrontation of Zionist arms factories, that direct role of resistance here. We got to stand with those who face charges, who get arrested, who get labeled as terrorists. We have absolutely got to stand together. One of the most dangerous things in this movement are forces on the right wing and liberal forces who, instead of confronting our enemy, want to tell us to turn on each other and label each other too radical and too dangerous and blame each other for causing the problems rather than our enemies. So we got to stand together and fight with those who are on the front lines and fight with those who are on the small front lines here and refuse to be turned against each other and instead go harder toward the resistance and go sharper toward the left because this is our chance. Um, the resistance is on the front lines paving the way for all of us. So we've got to take up our responsibility to move forward. One last thing, and it's important to realize this thing. Yeah, Sorry, Khaled, did you have anything to add? I just wanted to say that the reason that Palestinians are living under siege and not just in Gaza, if you look at any Palestinian community today, whether in Jordan, in Syria, in Europe, you know, uh, there is some form of siege that Palestinians are, uh, you know, living under. And it's important when it comes to here in, in North America, uh, Turtle Island, to see that other struggles uh, that October 7th have opened or provided a forum for other struggles, the indigenous native people struggle, black liberation struggle, worker struggle, you know. These are really important to, uh, not just to talk about it, but to, to actually have a deeper look at how interlink and direct link to the Palestinian people struggle. And not just because we want to build alliance. I think we also need a dialogue and it has to be a two-way dialogue. Uh, Palestinian resistance, uh, we should not romanticize it in the way that, oh, everything comes from, you know, Palestine is pure and everything Palestinian resistance say is correct. And, you know, as if it's a one uh, hegemonic unit, uh, uh, we can learn so much from other people struggle and it will affect our resistance to become better uh, not just in terms of fighting uh, you know israel but also understanding uh you know the struggle in 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 its international uh you know dimensions and how important it is 
because often we see that some of the Palestinian leaders, even in the resistance, they go and put so much effort, for example, on building a relationship with a member of Congress or a member of Parliament or thinking that these people can actually make the difference. And they don't put the same efforts on popular movements. We don't put the, the same efforts on the basis of, uh, you know, the, uh, the struggle. And so we can learn so much. And I think that the more we look at Palestine as a cause for revolutionaries across the world, the more Israel, uh, you know, fears us, fears the Palestinian resistance and not the other way around. You know, everyone is looking at the knowledge, so much knowledge has been, you know, spread out because of October 7th, and, but, you know, before October 7th, especially, especially amongst younger generation. But Israel fears that. Israel fears this change that it's happening in the United States, in Canada, and in Europe, while we see it as a very important development, not just towards Palestine, but also what kind of societies we want to build here. And so for me, I think like the priorities for Palestinians is to build their resistance and their movement, but really what's happening in the United States and Canada, I feel like it is the most important thing that could actually have strategic effects on our struggle, not just in Palestine, but in the region. The reason the liberation of Palestine is so hard is not because Palestinians are not fighting, it's because the liberation of Palestine will mean changing the entire region and the entire world. Just imagine us crazy Palestinians owning 400 nuclear warheads. What, what we will do with it? <laughs> Palestine, <laughs> Palestine would become a very dangerous place. And so, you know, and, and yes, the, that Arab world needs to be liberated. The Islamic world needs to be liberated. And, and that's why they're scared from Palestinians, because Israel is too important for them. And Israel is precious colony for this. Uh, and now the, the minute they see students in the United States, workers, our brothers and sisters in the Black Liberation Movement linking their struggle to the Palestinian people struggle, that's what makes Israel really, really scared and fears, you know, uh, people's role, people participation in the struggle. Thank you. Um, so we didn't get to go through all the questions, uh, just because I know that a lot of people here are probably fasting and have to break their fast. Um, but just wanted to extend a huge thank you to all of our panelists, our speakers. Thank you guys so much. And I apologize to Charlotte and Khaled if you guys couldn't hear very well and everyone else on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you so much for this amazing discussion. And I know that we'll hopefully continue this discussion on the resistance and make sure to continue to uplift the resistance in every action that we do here on campus yeah. and outside of campus. I was talking to Charlotte recently, there was an event in suburban New Jersey, which is like, you can't have it. It's just and really a house. Like house. 20 to 30 people but I think it's on a way page of so you gotta realize <laughs> the people they like they support the resistance i'm sorry yeah it's all good maybe it should be undertake action and like the campaign to bring it back home okay. recording yeah. stopped you guys okay. just yeah. Yeah. I'll send it to everyone in the call. Okay. Thank you guys so much, Khaled and Charlotte. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you for hosting so us, comrades. Um, it was an amazing event. I'm so happy we yeah. managed to pull it off. And thank you guys for hosting on the webinar and everything. I know big cheers to all of y'all for dealing with everything today in addition yes. to everything else. Yes. Uh, we definitely could not could not do it without comrades like y'all. So, I'll let just lots of appreciation. And if there's any resources you think would be good to share with folks in follow up, I was trying to get within our lifetimes Telegram up before people leave. But we'll just send out like a follow up email 
We'll we'll give you Savvy Dunes and the Massar so you can put it with wolves and NSJPs. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Awesome. We have to run to break fast, but thank you guys bye bye. again. Bye. Bye, Charlotte. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> It was good. It was good. Not like the Brown one.